Hello, this is Reverend Ken Goodrich from First Presbyterian Church in Lake City, Florida. I'm humbled that the Holy Spirit has moved you to come and worship with us today. Today's text comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 31 through 36. It is Jesus and his classic lament over Jerusalem and for humankind as he goes to prepare for a death a resurrection, and our saving. I pray that the Holy Spirit that rests in your hearts, minds, and souls now activates in your minds so that you might get a glimpse of understanding of what Jesus might be calling you to do to minister in his name. Today's gospel lesson comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 31 to 36. Listen for the word of God as it touches your hearts minds, bodies, and souls. At that very hour, some of the Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And Jesus said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children, your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Jesus is brooding over the face of the deep, as it were, just as the Ruach was brooding over the waters of creation. Jesus is lamenting the excesses of Jerusalem's past and is anxious about the birth pangs that he must soon endure there. In the new kingdom of God, the blessed will not be those who come in the name of the power and of the strength, but rather those who come in the name of the humble and the faithful Lord of creation. It is to this end that Jesus must proceed even amid such inconsequential obstacles to God's will as Herod Antipas and Rome. For Jesus, God's passionate dream, compassionate desire, and bold determination is to gather God's human children closer and closer in God's embrace and his love. That mission and commitment is at the center of Jesus' work. Like a mother hen, God seeks to draw, embrace, include and welcome God's children into the family of humanity that God has intended from the dawn of Eden itself. The text this morning is a, is a classic lament. Now, a lament is one that expresses deep regret or great sorrow. And as Jesus laments, he says, How often have I desired to gather your children as a hen gathers her brood under her wing? How often have I desired, desired, the Greek word, theolo, exercising God's will. There is almost no stronger word in the Bible. It's also a very word, rare word in the, in the Gospel of Luke, appearing one other time when Jesus is the subject. I desire, I desire. The word points us and tells us something significant about Jesus' character. Our God, the Son, Jesus, yearns deeply to gather us in, pull us closer together. You can feel Jesus' love and great longing to gather us to himself, to bring us close, hold us, shelter us, keep us. It's a desire for an intimate relation with us. I don't believe I've ever thought of God desiring me, longing for me, 
Now, I've thought about God's immense love and even God's judgment, correction, and testing. Sometimes I even whisper to myself, just loud enough for God to hear, Where are you? Why aren't you helping me? Are you not interested in my situation? Oh, but the four short verses that we read this morning show us that in Jesus, God is close, very close, and God is desiring us. Perhaps this is the very nature of God that is completed in us. Perhaps this is the relationship that God is striving for with us. As I think about this, I, I realize that God's longing is not just seen in this single verse. It is the very theme of God's word. God always seeking us out. Right from the very beginning, God creates us. God says, let us, us, create humankind in our, our image. So from our creation, we are marked by God in the most intimate way possible. Now, just a few verses later, Adam and Eve are hiding in the garden. And the longing of God is voiced in the question that continues to echo, where are you? This is God's desire for us and is throughout the Bible. It always has been resonating. God is always seeking us out, making covenants against all odds, extravagant and silly odds. It is the same God that directed Abraham to consider the stars of the heavens as indications of the fruitful results of this relationship. Oh, it's that crazy shepherd that leaves 99 sheep to go after the one that's lost. It's the love-struck yet dishonored father running out of the house to welcome his prodigal child. It's what the Spirit does in our baptism, marking us as God's own. It's God looking for us, always looking and searching, claiming us, desiring us, reaching out and gathering in. But we hide, we resist, we flee, we follow our own way, embrace our own truth, live our own lives, and still God seeks us out. How often have I desired to gather you and you were not willing, Jesus says. Still God seeks us out. Still God longs for us. Why? Maybe God aches to show us who you and I, we, truly are. How beautifully we've all been made. How deep is our capacity for goodness and blessing. Maybe God's desire is to uncover for us the love that is at the very core and foundation of our being. All of this and yet many of us turn elsewhere for affirmation, confirmation, and support. God desires for each of us to be true to ourselves and fundamentally collected and connected to God because that is whose image we bear. I expressed a few minutes ago that there were two times that Jesus expresses desire for us. The other time is the night before his death. He sits with his disciples around a table and he says, I have eagerly desired, eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal with you. I desire to eat with you. And later that night he will be betrayed and be denied. And the next day he will die. But it is in this moment, his moment of desiring, his desire is for a renewed and unbreakable relationship with those at the table, sharing with them bread and wine, sharing them with them an abundant life and utterly and ultimately sharing of himself. My friends, the signs are all around us from the font to the table to the cross. The signs of God's desire remain ever before us, a promised presence in all things, at all times, a deep desire that we cannot hide from, resist or flee from. We can be anxious all we want. We can worry about not having enough. We can think about 
that we're not doing enough or that we have possibly failed God. Ah, God's desire for us still remains. We cannot stop it. We cannot prevent it. We cannot block it or even stop it. It's that strong. If we could but truly believe that God, the omnipotent one, the creator of all things seen and unseen, sovereign ruler of creation, the one who died for us, who defeated death for us, who loves us so much that he gave us the only son to accomplish all things, desires us for exactly whom we are. I wonder if we truly believe this, how that would change yours and my ministries. God's desire for us, regardless of our age, our gender, our sexuality, whether or not we have hair or not, God's desire for us is the vision of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is for you and it is, well, I pray for you as well. My friends, feel God's desire for you. It is the ultimate love. Amen.